Uh, all right. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. McGee, for keeping that conversation going behind me. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, all right. Welcome, everyone, to a new conference today. We are going to do uh, two tales from the VA. So these are both two patients who are recently, one is still admitted uh, and on one of our inpatient teams, and the other patient was recently uh, admitted here and discharged and is actually going to be following up in the RAC clinic this afternoon. So the resident who gets to see this person will have a head start uh, knowing what's going on. All right. Um, so I'm going to defer to the residents in the room today. Um, which case would you guys like to start with, number one or number two? Number one. All right. So Tesla says number one. That is where we will start. All right. So you have got a 67 year old man with hypertension, AFib, and HEFPEF, admitted on 3 1 for CAP and HEFPEF exacerbation. He was treated for CAP, uh, received IV diuresis, and on 3 6 to 3 7, he developed abdominal distension, bloating, and tenderness. And then he also said that he had sort of a decreased frequency and volume of stool. His vitals were stable at this time, and he had mild abdominal tenderness. Being the excellent interns uh, and residents that you guys are, you went ahead and ordered a uh, KUB, and this is what you see. So uh, everyone take, we'll say 20 to 30 seconds. This is not super subtle. Um, and then I'm gonna ask one of our interns in the room to give me their very focused read about what they see here. All right, it's, a, it's good to say sloppy Joe day at the VA. So this sort of fits in nicely with uh, that theme. Um, all right, cool. So uh, does any intern feel brave enough to give me their very focused read about what is abnormal on this KUV? Great, so Julia says there is very dilated bowel, which is 100% correct. So uh, this person is very, very dilated. And so the uh, inpatient team did an excellent job and decided um, to go ahead and get a CT scan of the abdomen as well to further work up this finding. And so before we, I show you guys the CT scan, what are you looking for on the scan? Cool. So Julia says she's looking for uh, whether there's a mechanical obstruction on that CT scan, which is absolutely correct. Okay. Let's take a look at that CT scan. So here's going to be the uh, axial cuts first. We'll play through this twice. And you guys should just shout out abnormalities as you see them. Play through that one more time here. All right, and then let's go ahead and give it the, uh, we'll do the front cut as well. This one I think is a little bit more impressive. We'll play that one more time. All right, so none of us are radiologists. Uh, Adam used to be Adam used to be Adam used to be a radiologist, but uh, saw the light. Um, so Adam will be our sort of expert uh, here. But does anyone in the room want to take a stab at what um, part of this gentleman's GI tract is currently abnormal? Great. So ascending colon. So basically, right, we're saying this is his colon that's abnormal. So as opposed to his small bowel, his colon is uh, dilated. Um, Adam, any additional thoughts on this? Yeah, it's not how it's there. I'm trying to give it away also the location of it. But in terms of where the obstruction is, you have to scroll down. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't give Adam the full tool to like actually scroll through this. Um, but the interesting thing is they give the CT scan and we have an official read here because I wasn't gonna just put this all on Adam. And here's the official read. 
Uh, they say that this person has diffuse gaseous distended colon with a relative sparing of the distal sigmoid without an obstructing lesion or definite transition point. And they say he has prominent stool in the cecum as well, um, but no pneumatosis was identified or anything else. So the big takeaway here is that this person has um, no obstructing lesion or definite transition point. So um, I want everyone to take like 30 seconds with the people at your table and give me um, your two big things that you'd want to be worried about now. Like what diagnosis are we possibly working with? And is there anything else we need to rule out now that we know there's no mechanical obstruction? Awesome, so some pretty good discussion in the room. Um, so um, does anyone want to volunteer? Megan, what are you guys concerned about when you see the CT scan? All right, cool. So Megan says she's concerned about toxic megacolon. And Megan, what is toxic megacolon? I was reading about this the other day. Um, basically, it's a monoxic infusion infection, and then it's usually good at eating. You don't get them if they get a real um, I don't remember exactly what the process was for why it was so large. I'm worried about that. Cool. Yeah, I actually don't remember the pathophys either, but the big teaching point there is uh, C. diff infection, like without diarrhea, you can get toxic megacolon. Uh, and so a good thing to keep on your differential. And one of the two things that surgery uh, and GI were concerned about in this case, I'll tell you that the C. diff test was negative. So we have ruled that out. And then, Yunan, what were you talking about? Yeah, what is Ogilvy's? Um, so, sorry, but it hurts. <laughs> but it's like Ilias Delarge colon, um, often seen in like older, well, chronically like older patients, electrolyte disturbances, meds, multiple surgeries. Awesome. So, uh, Yunan points out that it's a pseudo obstruction of the colon. So, you don't have a true obstruction, it's a pseudo obstruction. And that's different, right, from an Ilias. So, it's not an Ilias because an ileus is your small bowel and it's associated with dysmotility. So this is specifically your colon. And then, you know, one more time, just for everyone, what were the causes that you just named? So oftentimes um, electrolyte disturbances, medication can also do it, um, and surgery can sometimes be associated. Nice, awesome, that's perfect. Yeah, so electrolytes, medications, and surgery are gonna be your big precipitants here. And so essentially um, what Ogilvy's is, it's basically um, considered sort of loss of the parasympathetic tone of the GI tract. It's sort of an unknown mechanism, but it's a problem of the parasympathetics, which we will talk about more here in just a second. Okay, so um, you call surgery and surgery recommends a few things here. Surgery says, um, put this person on low intermittent wall suction. So L-I-W-S. They say to do that, you're gonna need an NG tube as well. And then uh, NPO with IV fluids if needed. Why is surgery not recommending uh, a bowel prep, laxatives, things like that? Cool, yeah. So uh, Danielle says risk of perforation. And so this is gonna be one of those times where you wanna avoid, uh, you wanna avoid um, laxatives. And so you do not want these people to have, uh, to be sort of contracting and, and you risk the risk, of, uh, increase the risk of perforation. So low intermittent wall suction, NG tube, and MPO, and sort of supportive care and see if they get better. So this person does not get better with those treatments and eventually undergoes a colonoscopy with decompression uh, by GI. And this is their post decompression film. And I think we can all agree that this looks substantially better. 
unfortunately, this person gets worse again. Here's the noon conference. This person has to get worse again. Um, and they start to have recurrent symptoms of their Ogilvy's. So 10 days later, a repeat scan is obtained, or a repeat x-ray. Uh, and this is the repeat scan. So I'll tell you guys that the, the important thing here is that this is the cecum and that this was measured as 12.9 centimeters, which is AB normal. That is too many cecums to have in your body, uh, too large of a cecum to have inside your body. So what I want you guys to do now is take like 30 to 45 seconds at your table. If you have a future GI doctor, that would come in handy. And I want you guys to talk about what your next steps would be for treating refractory Ogilvy's that has not responded to supportive care. Uh, all right, this is great. Some good conversation. Uh, so we'll start with uh, we'll start with Bill, who's a future uh, GI doctor sitting over in the corner. Uh, Bill and Manny, uh, what treatment bill would you consider in this guy? Awesome. So Bill says he wants to go for the neostigmine, which is the correct answer. Um, does anyone know what neostigmine's mechanism is? Uh, it is not anti close, not anti muscarinic, sort of the exact opposite. inhibitor. Oh, yeah, Levi jumping in from the ether to say that it's acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, so ACHE. Uh, so it's an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, and so we're going to talk more about this mechanism in just a second. And the specific indication in this case, which Corey and his group are talking about, is that this person has not responded to supportive care. So essentially, you set this time course of approximately like 24 to 48 hours before you should respond and their cecum is greater than 12 centimeters is typically the cutoff that most people use. And so if you meet both those criteria, um, consider neostigmine because the thing we're all concerned about is you risk uh, perforating. And that's obviously worse, a uh, worst case scenario. Okay, so to really understand neostigmine, uh, I apologize for what we're about to do, but we're gonna talk neuromuscular junctions here and it's gonna be great. So this is the neuromuscular junction, okay? So you get your presynapse uh, right up here, yeah. your postsynapse down here, and you've got your um, muscarinic receptors right here. So those are muscarinic receptors. So the way this is gonna work, so you have a presynaptic vesicle right here, which is filled with acetylcholine. That vesicle touches the surface. And when that vesicle binds, it releases acetylcholine into this synapse right here. So when you have acetylcholine, acetylcholine, right, is your predominant parasympathetic nerve, nervous, um, neurotransmitter. And so you get increased parasympathetic stuff. That's not how you spell that, but we're gonna go with it. So you get increased parasympathetic tone when you have more acetylcholine in your, neuro, in your uh, neuromuscular junction. So how do you get rid of acetylcholine? You use, right, acetylcholinesterase and you break that stuff down. So if the red of the eraser is the acetylcholinesterase, if you go through and erase all that, you decrease the amount of acetylcholine uh, and you decrease your parasympathetic tone. So if you have an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, right, the, ab the absolute opposite of that happens. You're gonna increase this once again, you're gonna like completely fill your synapse with acetylcholine and you're gonna really increase parasympathetic stuff. Are we all together on that one? So neostigmine, it's, a, it's ultimately, its end goal is you have increased parasympathetic activity. All right, so I want everyone now to take 30 seconds to your table and talk to me then about what problems you should anticipate if this person has increased parasympathetic activity 
or increased cholinergic activity. Throwback to med school. All right, we're coming back here. Uh, Meryl threw in the chat uh, sludge, which is great. Uh, also, shout out to Meryl who drew uh, the neuromuscular junction on a patient's whiteboard or door this weekend to talk about myasthenia, which sort of inspired this. Um, so super impressive. Um, but because I actually created one animation and not sludge, we're going with the other one. So to call back to what I initially had on the board to start the case, uh, this is dumbbell. So does anyone remember the components of dumbbells? as I draw out the letters here. All right, so what's D? Great, defecation, right? So it makes sense if we're using neostigmine, we want this person to defecate. Um, and the evidence suggests that most people who respond in neostigmine respond in about four minutes. So it's pretty fast. And so people often will have a bowel movement or pass a bunch of gas almost immediately. Okay, what is U? Great, urination. So all the fluids are flowing. What is M? Meiosis, how about B? Great, so bradycardia, but there's other stuff on there. The other big one is bronchospasm. Okay, how about E? I got one. Anyone? Emesis, yeah, emesis, great. Emesis or like excitation is another one that's kind of a eh, soft one. How about L? Great, lacrimation, and then what's the S? Great, salivation. Cool, so those are your those are your cholinergic symptoms. So this right here is also the cholinergic toxidrome. So even though I said this wasn't gonna be a tox thing at the beginning, we've snuck in some tox. So this is a cholinergic toxidrome. And so these are the symptoms you need to be aware of every time you give neostigmine. Um, interestingly enough, so right before the GI fellow tells you to give neostigmine, you do a brief medication review, and you see this is the person's current medications. If you guys were gonna look through this and find anything else on here that you think might be another relative contraindication in neostigmine, what would you pick? So digoxin, actually not a relative contraindication, right? Digoxin's a positive inotrope. So the metoprolol, it's a relative contraindication. It's not a true contraindication. So where does the like relative contraindication versus true contraindication come from? Uh, believe it or not, we don't have great data for neostigmine but we do have this study from 1999, which is what we base almost everything on. And so this study from 1999, um, this is gonna shock you. They looked at 21 patients over a four year period in Seattle, I believe. And what they essentially did was they said 11 patients get Neo and 10 patients get placebo, which was normal saline. Of these 11 patients, 10 had a positive result. Obviously with the patients who got placebo, zero had a positive result. And so our data for neostigmine comes from this paper. And so we think it works for people with Ogilvy syndrome in this situation. The actual contraindications in this paper, I'm not gonna belabor this point, but this comes up in the GI note. They said, if you had a baseline heart rate less than 60, which this person did not at the time they, they got the drug, a systolic less than 90, if you were perforated, obviously that's hopefully not happening. Uh, if you have active bronchospasm or you've gotten a prokinetic drug, that was um, mostly to help them kind of figure out whether it was the neostigmine working or the prokinetic agent. Okay, so those are the big contraindications. And that's the, the, what essentially what the GI team told the medicine team to watch out for um, when the neostigmine was being given. That patient was on 7 core 2, yeah. Okay, so this person gets neostigmine. And approximately five minutes after they get neostigmine, they have nausea, vomiting, and they go pulseless and code. So 
Put yourself in the shoes now of Matt Minturn, who was the resident on call that night and did an excellent job saving this person's life. Um, and I want you guys to talk at your table for about 30 seconds and give me what you would do to treat this person in the room during their PEA or asystole arrest. Yeah, just to confirm, they went bradycardic down to like the 20s or 30s and then became pulseless. All right, great. Some good discussion. Um, so what do you guys want to use to treat this person's uh, bradycardic arrest? Megan, what do you want to use? Atropine. Awesome, atropine. So in some ways, you don't really have to think about this one because it's a bradycardic arrest and it's part of our ACLS protocol. But atropine is the recommended thing. So you're going to put atropine in this person's system. Does anyone know where atropine works in this junction? Like, why does atropine work for bradycardic arrests? Nice. Yeah, so atropine blocks your muscarinic receptor. And so essentially what it does is it competes with acetylcholine for binding at the muscarinic receptor. Um, and another way that I think is a nice way to kind of phrase atropine's actions is it's a parasympatholytic. And so it's basically going to cut out all of your parasympathetic tone if you give someone a high enough dose. Um, the sort of tox, uh, another interesting tox note from this, uh, Megan was talking about organophosphate poisoning. Uh, there's another medicine you have to give in organophosphate poisoning called pralidoxime. And the reason for that is atropine only works at the muscarinic receptor. Um, and if you have organophosphate poisoning, you also have nicotinic receptor involvement. And pralidoxime is the one that competes at the nicotinic receptor. So atropine will not make anyone's neuromuscular problems any better, like their fasciculations or paralysis. It will only work um, on the muscarinic receptors, which control cardiac activity. And so that's why you have the atropine and pralidoxime or atropine and 2-PAM uh, in the same antidote. Any questions about uh, this person's arrest, why we give atropine, et cetera? All right, so this person actually got ROSC within about two minutes after getting atropine uh, and was conversing and sort of back to their baseline mental status. And so thankfully, uh, Matt Minturn uh, saved this person's life and they are now um, still hanging out getting care on one of our inpatient VA teams. So a good case highlighting uh, Ogilvy syndrome, which is not the most common thing, but does happen. And then neostigmine. And then the big thing to watch out for is uh, bradycardic arrests in the setting of too much parasympathetic activity. Uh, yeah, so actually they had a huge bowel movement during the code, and so they were decompressed afterwards. So not the not the ideal way to get to that end result, um, but it did help their uh, it did help their Ogilvy syndrome. Uh, Brian or Cassandra, any additional teaching points? No. Cool. All right. So case two now back up here. So this is a plant. This is a cartoon plant that I created. Um, this person was recently discharged from the VA and is gonna be in the RAC clinic this afternoon. So chief complaint, um, I've told prior groups this, my uh, big recommendation is always look at the ER triage note at the VA. It's like the first thing the person says when they walk through the door and it often helps kind of frame their case before we can um, influence them with our questions. And so this person says, I think I'm overdosing. They had a witness, which is the husband who witnessed this seizure this morning. They denied a history of seizure in the past. They took more tramadol than was prescribed due to chronic back pain denies any new pain. They verbalized a near panic sensation and their heart rate was 130 to 140 in triage. That was the only abnormal vital sign. They get an, e, uh, get an EKG in triage, which I'll pull up for you guys right now. And here is their EKG. 
So the nurse who performs the EKG hands this to you, walks away and says, what's your read? The nurse doesn't say that. Someone says, what's your read? Um, so take about 30 seconds at your table. And I want, uh, when we come back, an intern to give me their biggest abnormality on this uh, EKG. Dr. Chan is good. Dr. Chan's great. Um, he's on the right track. I'll say this is not TCA overdose, but I actually hadn't even thought about that teaching point uh, till right now, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, cool. All right. So um, does one of the interns want to give me their focused read of this EKG? A lot of silence in this room. Silence is deafening. So it's a relatively regular narrow complex left very long, long PR. Long PR. I think so. I think they keep doing it in one. Otherwise, I've never seen. Okay. So we've got we've agreed that this is a narrow complex tachycardia. Okay. Maybe there's a, I don't know. Maybe there might be. Uh, we'll reframe the question. Which segment is the most abnormal? Okay, so there's a bundle branch block, great. Um, QT is QT is very long. Yeah, so the QT is very very long here, and so um, right, it takes up a lot of space between your R to R. And so I'll tell you that the QT was measured as 627 on this EKG. And then I'm actually going to defer, Dr. Chan. Can you tell me why you were concerned about TCA overdose in this person? Um, I guess the first thing would be this, the, the tachycardia. Uh, second thing is, I, I'm trying to remember, but I, I, I think that AVR looks very abnormal um, because you have a very tall, I guess, RS, you know, second R prime. Um, and I seem to recall the R to S ratio, the TCA or something. Yeah, that's all right. So it's an R to S ratio. I think it's like greater than 0 0.7. Um, but essentially, if your R wave is significantly larger than your S wave, uh, you should start thinking about TCA. And so this actually, I hadn't even considered that in this case, because um, the person soon gave a little bit more history, but that would be a great thought. So tachycardia, long QT, and this R long QT. Uh, would all, should all make us think TCA, which I had actually not considered till now. But this person does have a really long EKG, or a really long QT. And so um, we're actually going to do a little fictional path in this case, because this is not what happened next. But while you were evaluating the EKG, and I'll emphasize this is not what happened next, uh, the nurse uh, hands you this telestrip. So everyone, I want you to take 30 seconds. Uh, the questions are, what is the rhythm? And then how do you want to manage this rhythm as the person uh, so turns blue in front of you? <laughs> All right, people got there pretty quickly. Um, Danielle, what uh, what rhythm are we working with here? Cool. So Danielle says we are working with torsades, which is absolutely correct. And um, what treatments do you guys want to give? Great. So you give mag. Perfect. Um, anything else anyone wants to give? Electricity. Electricity. Okay, we're gonna shock. 
perfect. It's a good place to start. Um, we have a future cardiologist in here. Eric is sitting in the corner hanging out. Um, Eric, what are your thoughts on this? Torsades, and then what would you do? Yeah, I think I'll be a little bit more broad and call it polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Um, you can have both torsades mediated polymorphic CT and non torsades mediated. Uh, the non torsades mediated is due to ischemia. And so if you have a history of someone that may have overdosed, we know they have a long QCC, so that would be the torsades part. Um, and that we want to treat by correcting the thing that caused it. Um, you want to give magnesium because um, electrolytes are a really common uh, trigger for that too. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I think uh, that's a, a good start. Someone sitting in front of you goes into a shock for them. Uh, my preference is to just chalk them as soon as you can get electricity on. If there's not a code card in the room and it's gonna be more than like 10 seconds, then I usually will start a PPR and try and get through a full two minutes uh, before shock. Awesome. And Eric, uh, would you give this person amiodarone if it came up during your uh, ACLS algorithm? Yeah, so this is, we kind of fictionalized the case, but this is based on a case of a patient I took care of a years ago, um, and they kept going back into this rhythm. And so that was the question is, we've given them now like 8, 10, 12 grams of magnesium. Uh, we've shocked them once. Uh, they're not fully going unconscious every time. Uh, but can we give an antiarrhythmic? stabilize the person's torsades. Um, so yeah, let's have a little discussion uh, at your table of does this person need another therapy? And if so, what would that be? Great. So for those who couldn't hear, uh, Eric proposed, do they need another antiarrhythmic therapy or any other therapy? And what would you choose? All right, uh, some good discussion. Uh, we'll go with uh, Eric's tables over there. What do you guys want to do? Uh, other therapies, antiarrhythmic. Anyone in the room? Feel free. Okay. Talked about lidocaine. Great. Um, perfect. Uh, Jonathan, what were you talking about? We're talking about keeping them very tachycardic with uh, isoproteranol. Great, so talking about keeping them tachycardic with isoproteranol. Great. Would anyone give this person amiodarone or anything to slow them down? There's a philosophical discussion me and Eric had in the office five minutes before I walked over. That's why I yeah. asked. Great, I like it. Put a nickel down, amio. All right, Eric, which one of these is most correct, least correct? What do we do? Yeah, so I, I, I like the top two answers, lidocaine and isoproteranol. And I think what I know said that I was referring to is that um, remember that the, the QTC is um, rate dependent. So uh, the QTC is the QT interval divided by the square root of the RR. So at slower rates, heart rates, the QT is longer and uh, you're more susceptible to have a pause. Uh, the, the mechanism of torsades is when you have a, a um, early exergy, you have a pause while the myocardium is resetting, and then you have another um, exergy that comes right on top of when the native beat kicks right back in. So that's, you get an R on P, 
Um, and that starts this cycle of social time. So you don't want any pauses, you don't want any periods where the myocardium is um, has ended its refractory period and it's open to new depolarization. You want to keep your heart rate up. Remember, amiodarone has um, properties of all of the antiarrhythmic types, which include uh, AV nodal blockade. And so you don't want to slow this person's heart rate or prolong their cardiac cycle. Um, so lidocaine, I have seen used like this, but isoprogeranol to keep the heart rate up is um, probably the best option to stabilize this person while you're correcting the underlying cause. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. So just to recap, so isoproteran all found on the code cards. If you know it's torsades or if you have high suspicion it's torsades, helpful to, um, like Eric said, keep them out of that recurrent R on T phenomenon. Okay. So thankfully this person did not go into torsades in the, in the ED. They did get a bunch of magnesium and their rates slowed back down. Um, so then they get admitted to medicine. And again, really excellent job by our admitting resident to take a good history here. And uh, that's not it. So here is our initial history. She's a 33-year-old woman with migraines, PTSD, anxiety. So she said prior to going to sleep, she took a few tabs of tramadol. And she's also been taking six tabs of kratom per day. Per collateral from her partner, she was falling asleep, let out a scream, limbs tensed, flexed, and she began shaking, lasted for 30 seconds. She appeared confused for five minutes afterwards, no prior history. And this is why she came into the ED initially. So, what I want you guys to do, I had actually not heard of Kratom until about two weeks ago. So I want people to take like 30 seconds at your table and you can even use your own phone or like up to date and tell me, can we implicate Kratom in this woman's presentation? And what is Kratom? All right, let's come back. So um, before I ask what the groups came up with, Kratom uh, comes from a Southeast Asian plant called Mitragyna speciosa. That is the that is the botanical name. Corey's a big botanist and uh, huge, botanist. huge, huge botanist I found out today. Um, so Mitragyna speciosa, the Mitra part um, is proposed because they thought the leaf looked like the miter of a bishop. Um, and so that's, that's what I attempted to create with this illustrator leaf here. Okay, um, so what did you guys come up with? Can we implicate Kratom in this person's overdose? And uh, what does Kratom do? Nice, so if you do a simple Google search, you will see that Kratom is a mu opiate receptor. So a mu opiate agonist, but also has stimulant like effects, great. And so that ties in nicely. So Kratom is actually used uh, over the counter. It's OTC in Colorado, but people have used it for sort of opiate withdrawal. Um, and so if you don't wanna go through opiate withdrawal, you can use Kratom to hopefully decrease those symptoms. The problem with that is you can also become addicted to Kratom uh, because it is a mu receptor agonist. Can we implicate Kratom in this person's seizure versus long QT, arrhythmia, whatever we're calling this? The way I'm asking this, you probably can. I'm like, it's a very leading question, but yes, we can. And so um, always read your notes. So the cardiologist uh, fellow wrote this really, really nice uh, addendum where he cited a uh, article from uh, a very small journal, but essentially what this article looked at was they took Kratom and they gave it to mice. Uh, so the mice got Kratom and they found that Kratom uh, basically messed with a, um, basically like a potassium current inside your heart. And their ultimate uh, sort of takeaway from this was that Kratom could uh, predispose to torsades. 
because it messes uh, in mouse models with the uh, like refractory potassium current uh, that leads to torsades. So we can implicate kratom in this person's overdose, uh, probably. So what else does kratom do? Kratom can also cause seizures by itself. So she could have seized from her kratom. Uh, it causes respiratory depression uh, when combined with other opiates. And then it causes pretty bad uh, withdrawal symptoms if you are dependent on it long-term. I think the next question that Megan brought up is she was like, is there some place in Rhino that sells this? Uh, she's trying to find it right now for whatever that's worth. Uh, and yes, there is a place in Rhino that sells this. Um, and so the problem is that Colorado is not one of the states that has um, uh, outlawed kratom uh, as like many places in the US. And so this is from the New England Journal last year in 19, uh, 2019, so two years ago actually. And they basically looked at um, death records from 1999 to 2017. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but there were 15 deaths which they attributed to Kratom. And so um, this is something that is in Denver. You can buy it in Rhino. Uh, more people use it. More people use it than we probably uh, ask about. Um, and like we saw today, it can be associated with long QT and can be associated with respiratory depression and seizures. So a good drug to uh, be aware of. Any questions about Kratom? Cool, nice. Uh, I did not know that. So direct liver injury and then asking about kava kava at the same time. I like that. Has anyone else experienced, uh, not experienced yourself Kratom, like please don't say that out loud. Uh, has anyone else had a patient uh, use Kratom or had a person admitted because of Kratom? Yeah. And was it pretty similar to, did they, was it just the liver injury or? Yeah, it's just terrible feeling. Interesting. Yeah, so again, right, this is a very, very addictive uh, opiate. Um, and so in Southeast Asia, they put in a bunch of drinks and, and other herbal preparations, um, but we should be aware about it. So today's conference, right, just to zoom back out, we talked about uh, Ogilvy syndrome, why neostigmine uh, is useful in this situation, but then what we should watch out for, right, that dumbbells and the cholinergic toxicity. Uh, Matt Mintern saved a life by giving atropine, and that person is now um, recovering on one of our inpatient medicine teams here. And then we talked about a person who presented with kratom overdose uh, in combination with tramadol. And hopefully next time we take a social and drug history, if it's compatible, uh, ask about kratom. And stay away from the store in Rhino. <laughs> and that's all I got. Thanks, guys.